the Accord Consensus Protocol. Before I get going a little bit about myself, Mick Sam Weaver, I am on the PMC for the Cassandra Project. Uh, I've been around uh, for a while, tiles and net beans and a number of other projects. Um, a quick an anecdote to share here is that um, while I would like to think of my younger self as quite idealistic, as we are in our youth, when it comes to open source, I realized that I was always quite a pragmatist. And I was involved uh, in Bugzilla very early on, um, and I was involved in the NetBeans project months after it was open sourced. And it was because of a, uh, an attitude of always wanting uh, to find something to rip and run with. And it usually always comes from what I have to do at work. So you know, I've given a job at work, and I'm like, I don't want to write that code from scratch. Take a look around, what's out there that I can rip uh, and go from there. And if you're that type of engineer, then giving back is usually part of that equation. And that's a large part of open source. So that's a little bit about me. What I'm going to talk about is the Accord Consensus Protocol that is, of course, being implemented at the moment. It is being implemented at a, as a stand. It has been implemented as a standalone library uh, in the Cassandra Accord project. It is currently around 280 source files, 60,000 lines of code. So it's not a big project, um, though the Cassandra code can often be quite condensed. Um, and in the Cassandra project, which is where its main application is at the moment, outside of the service accord package that has been introduced, we've only touched 27 files. So you can see that it's quite a new addition to the Cassandra project and not touching or polluting too much of the existing code base. Um, the accord project started many years ago inside uh, Apple. Uh, and in coordination with the University of Michigan. Uh, in September of 2021, the CEP15 hit the project. Uh, discussion started, and a month later we voted on it and work started properly. That has gone on for a couple of years now, two and a half years. At the end of last year, we decided to push it back from the 5.0 release to the 5.1 release. We're expecting the 5.1 release to come out after summer. I'm going to break up the talk into the following sections. Uh, because this talk is usually a 60 minute talk, um, I'm going to run through these initial sections very quickly uh, so I can spend a little bit more time on consensus protocols and Accord itself. So first up, when we talk about distributed data, um, to get started, to think about distributed data, I'm going to use a sentence that comes from the opening paragraph of the Accord paper. Modern applications replicate and shard their state to achieve fault tolerance and scalable performance. This presents a coordination problem that modern databases address using leader-based techniques that entail trade-offs either as scalability bottleneck or weaker isolation. That pretty much sums up the problem that we face with distributed data and why we see largely leader-based uh, approaches being used. And of course the reasons that we scale data are a few. It can be because we want always available, always available, available. It can be that the amount of data that we have doesn't fit onto a single machine. It can be because of the read and write traffic. Um, and it can also be because we need geo-based replication. So when we talk about scale, it's not always the same thing. It can be for various different reasons. There's two common ways of, of solving this problem. 
and that is with sharding um, or with petitioning. If your application naturally shards its data, that makes sense. And we see a lot of people doing that as well. And sometimes it meets the natural sharding that happens in the domain, uh, the data domain or in the application. And sometimes it doesn't. And we see them kind of fighting against the technology. Cassandra from the beginning chose the petitioning approach because it was understood that that had, uh, for the database, the best horizon. But maybe not always the simplest way to do things. Quick into it to, con to Cassandra. Um, this is a business slide, different reasons that you want to use Cassandra. Um, touches on the reasons for scale that I mentioned. Linear scalability is an inter interesting one. Uh, that's quite of a, like a, a techie view on it. I often think that linear scalability is better explained as predictable costs over growth, which is important for businesses. Also, hopefully, uh, uh, also with Cassandra 5.1, we have uh, a significant change in how the cluster coordination happens with the TCM, the Transactional Cluster Metadata. That's going to also open up a lot of doors for us around how we scale. And I'm hoping that we can start to change this terminology from linear scalability to elasticity. Because elasticity is a term, term that is uh, far more attractive to engineers immediately. Lin l scalability has led us to be called the database of last resort. Uh, we are the database that, that works as you scale. We are the choice that you end up with, um, but not everyone's first choice, and we want to change that. Another problem with Cassandra is that we are a eventually consistent database. Now people say, yes, you can do strong consistency. And yes, we have lightweight transactions. But as far as the strong consistency goes, yes, it's, you get consistency when things are working. The problem is under the failure modes. The only guarantees that we've got is eventual consistency. When things are failing, you have to appreciate that the technology is eventually consistent. This becomes a problem. The other problem that we have, uh, and the example that I'm going to use through these slides, is uh, multi-table, multi-partition transactions. When you want to do something like this, do a simple transfer of money from one account to the other, in Cassandra, it's a little bit tricky, especially to make this work over value modes. That takes us to the need for ACID. And before you think I'm a hippie, ACID actually came out in the late 70s and early 80s, and the authors were uh, fully on the theme already. Um, so this joke has been around for a long time. I'm going to give a very quick run through of this. Um, atomicity, it either works or it does not consistently. Consistency, reads are always consistent to what has been written already. Isolation, each user is guaranteed that experience is as if they were the only one using the database. Durability, data is never lost. It's really simple explanations, um, but it works. What's interesting with the Accord Consensus Protocol is, um, and it's, I think it's happening, it's, it's happening already, we are lifting the definition of asset for databases today. ACID has been for a long time something that we associate with the RDMS crowd. And it is typically those data um, operators that have kind of espoused ACID properties and the distributed database crowd has gone, no, nah, you don't really need them, you can work around it, you've got base, um, we're worried about cap, etc., etc. And it feels like we're kind of closing the loop on this. A quick example to give is durability. 
Right, durability today means a distributed system. That definition has already kind of implicitly been raised on us. We're going to show that we can also raise uh, the definition for isolation. So let's have a look at this example again, just very quickly. Atomicity, it is critical that both statements either succeed or fail together. Consistency, accounts must have a positive balance at all times. Isolation, other users must not see half-updated data while the transaction is in flight. And durability, we don't lose data, that's what databases do. Talk about RDMS systems. Well, a lot of people don't realize, uh, especially since servers introduced multi-cores, the RDMS databases don't actually give us asset. They, most modern databases only implement snapshot isolation, if even that. Some of them do implement uh, higher levels, but they're not enabled, and if you try to enable them in production, uh, it just won't work. Um, If you want to go in the, into this in more detail, this is a graph from Jepson, which is fantastic. Um, what the Accord Consensus Protocol is achieving is this strict serializability at the top. It is the, the, the combination of both the isolation levels as well as the consistency levels. So for serializability, we are talking about always ordered and atomic. This doesn't have to be. This is on the um, this is on the left on your left side. Um, this doesn't always have to be real time consistent. This the left side is more about the structure of objects together. Linearizable. This is more about atomic and real time consistency. So when you have a notion of a point in time when a transaction occurred, that's more your linearizable side. When we talk about snapshot isolation, uh, which is what a lot of databases do, this means that they're not guaranteed to be ordered, that they're open to a network partition. Um, this can lead to problems with write skew um, or read-only transaction anomalies. One of the saving graces with the RDMS systems is that they often don't have enough traffic to hit these problems enough. Um, but when it comes to a distributed database, all of a sudden, these problems become more real for us. So we're actually having to come back and do this properly. Okay, so quick use case example, looking at Cassandra. Um, one of the ways that we try and get around this today is using lightweight transactions. Here you have an example of how you may achieve this. Um, query, or, query one, which is kind of option, optional, and it's really a, a read before write any pattern, but you can just check, does this user actually have the money in the account? Query two, okay, let's take $100 out of that account, um, if it still exists, that's your lightweight transaction. And then uh, query three, uh, go update the other account, adding that $100. A lot can be done in Cassandra with queries and with lightweight transactions if you just order things correctly. But even here, we have a problem. Uh, that should be obvious. If the system goes down in between two and query three, you have lost $100 in your system. So moving on, consensus protocols. For consensus protocols, I'm going to break this up into two sections. I'm going to talk about the leader-based consensus protocols, and I'm going to talk about the leaderless protocols. The leader-based protocols, uh, some of them, Raft and Calvin. Most of the technologies that we know today are using the leader-based approaches.
Cassandra uses uh, Paxis, which was the first protocol out. Um, and Paxis is today really a group of different protocols. And there's a number of other protocols which have been uh, extended or built beyond that, which I'll cover briefly. At least I'll cover Caesar and, and Tempo. When Cassandra implemented its lightweight transactions, it used Paxis. Now, RAF wasn't out yet, so it's not like we really had a choice. But Paxis also uh, architecturally aligns better with Cassandra and its masterless approach and its need for, for linear scalability. The RAF protocol came along later. Um, it is the leader based approaches are easier to, to implement often easier to operate despite some fundamental problems to them and often perform better or at least um, more predictably and I'll go into that but there are some serious problems with them uh, I think the classic example is with SED if you have tried to set up multiple Kubernetes clusters across regions um, and fought with SCD, you know this pain point. Uh, trying to get one of these to work over different geo regions or, or, or to combine is hard work. So jumping into that quickly. With stable leaders, we have the problems of uh, Poor latency if your clients are not in the same region as the leader. When the leader fails, you have downtime. That may only be a second or two, um, but you have downtime until it relaxes. This is the, the leader elect problem. And general transactions and scaling them is very difficult. By general transactions, I mean this notion of multi-partition or multi-table. The flip side of this is, for all of those clients that are in the same region, optimal latency. For all... Um, dealing... As an operator dealing with stability, it's pretty simple. It's binary. Things work or things don't work. Um, and your performance is pretty predictable as well. It's working. This is my performance profile. Or it's not. I've got to go fix it. Moving on to no the leaderless approach. So here, we're basically taking, saying that there is no fixed leader. Any node can be the leader or the coordinator. And for that to happen, and this is, this is the basis for Paxos, for that to happen, there's these two round trips to agree you're the leader for that transaction. Some of the, the basic problems, some of the problems with the original Paxos that happen here is that when you have contention around here, uh, the prepare and the accept phases, uh, this thrashes. And if you've operated a Cassandra cluster and you've had light range transactions on hot petitions or under contention, you will know this pain. So light range transactions, not good, looking for something better. Uh, especially under contention. To go into that to a bit more detail, so that first round trip is what we call a fast path. And it's going around and it's asking the nodes um, or the recipients that uh, can this tra transaction apply. And if it gets a super majority, it can do that just in one round trip. If it doesn't, it then needs to do the second round trip 
Um, and this time it has more information with it that was collected on the first round trip. And this time around, it only needs a simple majority um, to move forward. The subsequent Paxis type uh, protocols trying to improve on this particular problem. So first up we have Epaxis. And what Epaxis is trying to do is it looks at the dependencies of the transactions which are in flight. And so here you can see two different transactions in flight and they're looking to get that supermajority. We have a transaction A and we have a transaction B. Right? And what happens here is that a transaction is okay because the majority of the nodes goes, we've got A and you can, you can come in first. Um, well, the B it doesn't work because it, um, it, there are nodes that it doesn't, it can't see it. After Apaxis came Caesar. And what Caesar did was introduce timestamps. So not just the dependencies of the in-flight transactions, but their timestamps. This makes life a lot simpler and it reduced that contention, conflict rate. But of course timestamps don't always work. You have clock skew on the machines, unless you've got dedicated hardware or vector clocks. Um, and you've got latency hops between regions. And the problem with Caesar was uh, having a deal now with both timestamps and dependencies. Uh, it introduced an un unbounded commit latency um, when working with it. And sometimes that second round trip actually had to fall back into a third round trip. So now we have even more unpredictable performance um, despite sometimes that first round trip working better. After Caesar comes Tempo. What Tempo did was quite clever in that it realized it didn't need to work with the dependencies at all. It could work with just the timestamps. Uh, this simplified a lot. It no longer needs that third round trip. Um, but what they threw out was commutativity. And what commutativity here means is the ability to see with those, uh, that depend the dependencies of a transaction which don't actually have to be dependencies. For example, different read statements uh, are not blocked by each other. This may work for uh, simple implementations of a uh, consensus protocol, but for a database for Cassandra, where read traffic is, is expected to be a significant part of the workload, this is un unacceptable. So summing that up. Um, we can, we can ensure that clients, no matter where they are, are going to get similar latencies. We can now solve strict serializability. Um, and we know that when we have a failure, it only impacts the nodes that have to be impacted by that transaction. So failures are isolated to a smaller subset of the cluster. The downsides of this is we get uh, kind of a, a poor stability under failure. And this is challenging for an operator because there isn't that binary it works or it doesn't anymore. There are levels of degradation. And this particularly impacts capacity planning on a cluster. When you capacity plan for a cluster, are you giving the cluster enough resources for optimal uh, operations or are you having to deal with different levels of failures and for, for how many different levels of failures do you work with and then all of a sudden you've got to understand all this stuff so it becomes tricky the same thing applies for performance as well okay so moving on to accord
While a cord is trying to do a lot, we're trying to introduce general transactions. We want to be able to do transactions over multi partitions and multi table. For Cassandra users, this is a really big deal. We want strict serializability. This is a game changer in the database industry. The only other database uh, that we're aware of in the industry that does this is Spanner. And Spanner does it very slowly and with dedicated hardware. We want that leaderless approach, um, but also we want to solve the problems of predictable latency and the failure tolerances. We want it to operate normally with only a single round trip. We want that commutativity. We don't want aborts. Okay? We don't want the user to ever have to roll back a transaction. If, there ends, if the transaction landed in the system, it's in the system. And we want to use commodity clocks. Despite all that, uh, the, problem, the problems that Accord solves is really only two. It, it, it introduces two novel ideas that we'll go into, fast path electorates and the reorder buffer. And those two novel ideas give us this. So the first problem is when we're doing this fast path, why are the fast paths so big? Why do we need that supermajority? We need that supermajority because of our failure modes. They need to be durable. So if you have two transactions in flight and they crash at uh, recovery time, you need between them to then have that quorum or simple majority so you can reconcile the transactions that you've got and put them back into the system. What we can do is this idea called flexible path, fast path electorates. It's kind of an idea taken from flexible Paxis. What we can say is, um, you know, for each transaction, if we can deterministically uh, shrink the, the replicas that we choose that supermajority from, we have a smaller uh, supermajority to find agreement on. So if we take out two, then that supermajority is one less replica that we have to include on that initial round trip. Now, of course, we can do this all the way down to a simple majority. This is the performance of the optimal. The problem with this is uh, if we, we're starting with this approach, then you have no room for, for further failure of nodes. So what the default configuration for the fast path uh, electorates will basically be this plus one or two nodes, um, depending if you want the, these, these to, the transactions to still work when one node is down or with two nodes down. You can also reconfigure this uh, in a system. The other problem that we're trying to solve is the, these timestamp conflicts. And what we've done, what Benedict and Scott have done um, is this notion of a reorder buffer. This requires a timestamp protocol and as we, was demonstrated, neither of the, the previous protocols really worked for us. So this is part of the Accord Consensus Protocol. And the basic idea here is that uh, timestamps, the Lamport clocks, so each timestamp on each node is suffixed with a unique identifier for that node. Um, so in the system, we know where timestamps are coming from, and that way each node knows uh, the clock skew of other nodes and also the network latency hop to other nodes. So when the transaction comes in, it knows, it knows 
it can synthetically or reorder the, the timestamp of a transaction knowing where its recipients are. So that uh, transactions are, are ordered um, correctly in advance and will not conflict. I'm out of time, I think. I've only got two more slides here. Uh, one is the proof. We've also got the proof up on a poster in the poster room. Um, just quickly, and the first algorithm here, this first, the top half, is our uh, fast path uh, working, and the second half is the slow path. We can go into that more detail if you want to find me and, and, and explain it line by line. Um, the recovery mechanism of cord is really interesting. Um, I find it pretty fascinating how uh, it can replay transactions, there's no need for abort, um, and what it does to make that happen. Where are we today with it? Uh, this is a syntax of what the transactions are going to look like. The three main parts here. Uh, you have this let statement, which is basically these are the, you're selecting the variables or the fields that you're going to use in your condition. Then you have the select statement. The select statement is the fields that you're going to return to the user. And then you have the condition and the update statements. Authors and contributors, these are the people currently involved in that code. Big shout out goes to them. Where are we? with all of this work. Um, it's about to get merged to Trunk. Cassandra is not a simple piece of technology. Um, it was about to get merged probably a year ago. They are working on uh, UX on edge case problems. Some of the things which have been challenging have been you know, dealing with upgrades, dealing with migrations, both forward and back from the Paxis, uh, dealing with topology changes in the cluster, the read repair mechanism, um, which often trips up a lot of different piece, new features that we implement in the code base, and how hints work, especially when you have a system which is doing transactions and not transactions, and we have a whole, a whole possible, whole number of possible edge cases. And it's not the only thing coming in, Cassandra. Uh, we've been busy on many fronts. Thank you very much. <laughs>